I'm Ellen Klein with Sam Shriver, and this is the beginning of tape three. Sam, you were telling me about three of the best years, and um, about what was happening in those years after the war, about uh, finding children and transporting people. Tell me more about that. Uh, well, to find children after the war was, of course, was very difficult. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think I told you about it already. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we put these children in homes where we uh, educated them, and then uh, we kept them there. There was the war was uh, going on. Uh, the state of Israel was not proclamated right. yet, right. <coughs> so we were educated these kids, kids and prepared them uh, for the Aliyah and uh, for to go to Israel. And uh, there was also a group of children which were in hiding in Romania. Okay. Uh, the children in, in uh, Romania, they went into the woods, mm. were living there, had their leaders, the leaders were 15 years old, oh. little kids, older kids, but mainly uh, they were kids. And uh, after the war, these kids came out of the woods. Now, Romania, behind the Iron Curtain and everything, so uh, finally these kids, we got 500 of them to Holland. Mm. And they went in that uh, big building that used to be a building for sick people, Jewish sick people, mm -hmm. uh, dement people in uh, Apeldo in Holland. Okay. And we, they were there and they were educated and prepared Hashra Aliyah mm -hmm. for the Aliyah and uh, all the Shaliyahs there and teaching them and everything. And when the state of Israel was proclamated, these kids, all of them went to Israel. Mm -hmm. And the most joyous day of it was when these kids came from Appledorn mm -hmm to Amsterdam, where they stayed for a while, mm. and then they were marching in a whole group. I was in front with my car, with the first Israeli flag, <laughs> because the state of Israel was proclamated, right on top of that car, and they were walking through the city mm. to the central station in Holland from where they were going to uh, Marseille from where the Exodus ships were going to Israel. Mm. That was such a joyous day. But the, such a nice part of the whole thing is when that was all done and the kids are gone. Years later, it happened only, this happened in 1948 after the state was proclamated. About eight years ago, my wife had to see an, uh, a doctor, mm. and I went with her, and when we get, got to that uh, doctor's office, the receptionist, talking with her was a middle-aged woman, and uh, talk, and more talk, and uh, anyway, she said, your name? Uh, I said, well, that's the Dutch. And she tells me that she was in Holland, and I asked her how, for my, she was one of the 500 children from Israel. She came eventually to Canada and had married the doctor. Uh, mm. in doctor, he was then a young man, they were both young people. That was, it's, it's a mm. small world, you know, mm. people were met. And we met uh, again there. And we could talk, and I still see her on occasions now. That's beautiful. It's uh, nice, uh, it, was, it, was, it was nice. And, uh children were the reason that you started working at the Holocaust Museum, right? Uh, yes, what actually happened, uh, I haven't got a day mm -hmm. where I can commemorate my parents. Right. There isn't a day, a set day or, or, or a grave site that I can go to. Uh, I did put my parents' name in Miami at that uh, monument in Miami mm -hmm. on those tableaus there, you know, the big yes. uh, uh, monument there. Uh, but I haven't got a grave site or a certain date. Yeah, I know when they, 
separately were killed uh, in, in uh, the death camps. But so I read in the newspaper in St. Pete Times that in the uh, Bain Pines, uh, where the, the former soldiers and everything here in St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. they uh, were having a commemorating service for the soldiers and people who died during uh, World War uh, II. And I said to myself, that's a new, and, and that's a good uh, opportunity to go and uh, mm -hmm. commemorate my parents and the soldiers who died and uh, who gave their lives so that I will live and so many others. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I went down there. <coughs> Sorry. When I came there, I felt like an outcast because these old soldiers were sitting there, one with only a jacket, another one with a cape, you know, and then, and, but I was just dressed in a normal suit. There was a uh, man there, white collar, was a, a, a nice guy, uh, happened to be a black man, he came over to me, uh, was a priest or some kind, and, he, and I said to him, I said, I, I look like an outcast, I'm not a soldier. Said uh, I'm here for the reason to commemorate my parents. I uh, I'm, I'm a Holocaust survivor myself, so I uh, I like to commemorate here all the people who are Holocaust survivors. But maybe I like to talk to the boys. I said no, 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 no. I'm sorry, no, no. I I, I cannot talk. And, well, I said no. Are you kidding? I'm not a speaker. No, no, no. Anyway, he came back to me later again and again, and finally I think, oh my God, give in already. And then I said, okay, and so when he asked me to go on the stage there on the, on the mic to speak, I said to them that uh, I'm a Holocaust survivor, I was liberated by the Allied forces, and I'd like to thank you guys very much for what you have done. And, and if it wasn't for you guys, then I, I, I wouldn't be here, and I, I didn't know how fast to get off the mic, and uh, mm -hmm. that was it. When the whole ceremony was finished, and I leave, was about to leave the building, I hear a man calling me, sir, 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 and I look back and I see a big guy standing there. I said, yes, what can I do for you? He said, uh, I am the director of the Tampa Bay Holocaust Memorial and Education Center, which is now the Florida Holocaust Museum. He said, and it was Steve Goldman. I, uh, he said, I would like you to come there to speak. I said, I'm not a speaker. He said, well, come and uh, just see what's doing there. We have a museum there. And, uh, and so I went down there one day to see what's doing there. And when I got there, there was a docent just going around with children mm -hmm. to show the Anne Frank exhibition. Mm -hmm. And as I went going around, I see a picture of a friend of mine, mm -hmm. Simon Pierbaum guy from Holland that I what, used to be friendly. He was in my school, in elementary school, who was not there, but the picture was there. The, and then I see another picture of my father's youngest sister sitting on the railroad station oh. with a star, waiting with other people to be transported to Westerbork concentration camp. Oh. And when I saw all these pictures, I, I want to get out of the museum. I went out, I, 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 that's not for me. That's mm -hmm. not for me, and I came outside but there were children waiting to come in because it wasn't organized yet. The museum mm. had just started and unorganized they were coming one bus after the other and uh, they were waiting to, to go in. But in the meantime, to keep the kids going on the outside, they were showing them a movie about uh, Anne Frank. Mm. And so I asked one of the kids when I was outside, I, I had to get out of there. And I, I said to the kids, uh, did you see the movie of Anne Frank already? I said, well, like uh, Anne Frank, I'm also from Amsterdam, Holland. And uh, I was also with it and I've been there. And before I knew, I was talking to these kids mm -hmm. about my life and what I, and then they had to go in. Mm -hmm. But the other group waiting again, I started to talk. And before I knew, I was talking to these kids and the next kids. And the day went by with talking to all these kids. And the next morning when the museum opened up, I was there from opening till closing, talking to all these kids because they were, it wasn't organized yet. And they were coming at random, just one bus after the other. Right. So it was so busy there. Uh, and ever since I've been talking up till t today. <laughs> 
So um, you had some things you wanted to say about why it's important to talk about it. Yeah, it is very important. Now let me tell you why it is so important. Because young people have to know what happened for their own protection. Mm -hmm. And if they don't know what happened in the past, right. then it is very simple that history will repeat itself. Right. It has always been like that. And uh, it has been through the years like that. History will always repeat itself. And they have to know for their own protection what's doing and what has been going on. Survivors can be silent, mm. like me. I've been silent, like I told you, for 48 years. Mm. They can be silent, or they can lecture, or they can publish their stories. But like all of these, they contribute to memory. Right. But uh, memory is more than uh, information and more than words. I know that the Holocaust happened. I know, because uh, even though uh, years of uh, study have convinced me that I will never arrive at a level of real understanding. I will never arrive at a level that I will understand how these highly intelligent German mm. have lent themselves to do mm. what they have done mm. to kill 11 million un people. It, 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 it still, I can't get over it. It, 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 it is still getting me. People haven't gone, done anything, anything bad to anybody. To kill 11 million people for no reason, that will never, I will never be able to find peace with that for as long as I live. How do we know, I may ask, I know. Because I was there, I experienced it. That memory and the knowledge that goes with it will be gone forever when there are no survivors left. Because let's face it, Survivors won't be here forever. And I tell that to the children too. I tell the children when I speak to them that this is a very unique opportunity that they have today. An opportunity that their children, their grandchildren, will never have the same opportunity they have that they have today to meet a Holocaust survivor. I tell these kids, the students, that later on in life, if you ever are going to meet anybody who's going to say, that the Holocaust never happened. You can tell them, I met somebody who was there. I met somebody who experienced it. And you can tell these people who will deny the Holocaust that you met somebody who was there. That's why today I want to transfer my memory to you. That's what I tell these kids. And then I tell them one day, perhaps, well, I used to say 30 years from now, mm -hmm. and now I may be down already to 10 years from now, when there are no Holocaust survivors left, it will be your turn to speak for us. You will say that you are present when a survivor of the Holocaust, a witness, make you a witness for the other witnesses. And when one day you are no longer able to speak, then somebody else will speak for you. This way, in a thousand years from now, someone will stand and be a witness in a living chain of memory. Then I tell these children, I just transferred my memory to you. And that's how I leave them. And after I have been speaking to these kids, they come over to me and they thank me. I have tens and tens of thousands of letters over the last 20 years that I've been doing this from the children, which are the most amazing letters that I have ever read. Just imagine this here, what they write. Now that I met a survivor, now I believe the Holocaust really happened. What did they believe before? Uh, in the letters they write, uh, uh, you made a different person out of me. I will have more respect for my parents now. I will not, not hate no more. I will never do this or that again. You changed my life. I get the most amazing letters from children. Letters that I know they got the message. Letters I know that I reached them. And then I say to myself, I wish in one shot I could speak to all the kids in the whole world. Mm. Maybe yes, but it's not possible. But so I take them by school, one by one at a time. And I will do it for as long as I live, 
for as long as I can. And I hope that at least I have made some impression upon them because, let's face it, these kids have to know what happened for their own protection. And they have to learn what happened because, like I said it before, the Holocaust, unbeclumical. It's unbeclumical. There's no word to find for it than unbeclumical. How do, um, how do those children and how do those of us who will watch this, um, how do we honor the transfer of memory that you've given us? Well, we have to keep going the story of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. If you don't do it, then they will die out like the six million Jews and the five million non-Jews. Mm -hmm. The story of the Holocaust has to be kept talking because, uh, and learned and taught. Mm -hmm. And if this isn't done, this will die out like the people who died out. This is a story that has to be retold and retold and retold because this is the worst story that has ever, and the worst thing that has ever been and happened in the world. Mm -hmm. So let's face it, the Holocaust, unbeclumical. Mm -hmm.